Uh, right. So welcome everyone to this week's uh, MSI seminar. Uh, we have Hongman Liu from uh, NYU, and he will be talking about the extragalactic radio excess. Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure how we want to do questions, so uh, I guess we can hold off. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not really sure if you'd prefer to have questions during the talk or towards the end. I'm happy to have it throughout, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, then people can, yeah, put, put your questions in the chat or raise your hand uh, and ask um, if you have questions during the talk. Okay, so let's get started. Um, thanks, Ania. Um, so yeah, I'm Hongwan Liu. I'm a postdoc at uh, jointly appointed at NYU in Princeton. Um, today, I'm going to tell you some interesting sort of particle physics, um, but applied to uh, radio astronomy, uh, uh, an interesting model of how to explain uh, what we see in the uh, radio background at um, uh, relatively low frequencies. Uh, so this work is done in collaboration with uh, Andrea Caputo, uh, Siddharth Mishra Sharma, Maxime Pospolov, Josh Ruderman, and Alfredo Urbano. Um, and hopefully it will appear soon. Um, and as I said, I'm happy to take questions uh, at any time during the talk. So please just go ahead and interrupt me. Okay, so let's just jump straight into the outline. Um, I'm going to spend the first part of the talk talking about the extragalactic radio background. So what people have been uh, observing about the background and um, why we should even care about you know, considering new physics um, to try to explain what we see in the radio background. Then I'll go on to describe uh, aspects of our new particle physics model. Um, and in particular, um, stimulated decay is something that I will emphasize um, and that is very important to our model. And I'll spend some time explaining to you what stimulated decay is. Um, then the next part of the model that I want to spend uh, quite a significant amount of time talking about is dark photons. Um, which is a kind of um, particle that is very similar to, a, to the standard model photon, um, and in fact can mix with the standard model photon, um, producing uh, interesting uh, phenomenology such as oscillations and resonance conversions. Um, and then I will uh, finish up with the results, um, showing you that the model can produce um, uh, the right spectrum to explain uh, what we see in the radio background, um, uh, to explain how the radio background can be very smooth, um, as well as satisfying some uh, uh, known experimental constraints on dark photons or the properties of dark matter and, and so on. Okay, so let's just jump straight in and, and let's talk about what we actually know about the extragalactic radio background. Um, so let me begin by talking about the microwave background, which is what happens at slightly higher frequencies. And so this plot on the left here, uh, you've probably seen in one form or another. This is the measurement of the CMB um, energy spectrum as measured by Firus, I think, uh, in, the, in the 90s. And here you see a plot of the intensity versus frequency. Um, there are data points here that are so small that you can't see the error bars, um, but the predicted line here in black is the spectrum that you would expect if the CMB was a perfect black body with a CMB temperature of 2.725 kelvins. And you can see that it is a really, really, really good uh, match uh, to the observation. So below here, you can see what the residuals look like. So if we take these data points and subtract off the theoretical curve, and you can see that the error bars are on the order of like um, something like one in 10,000 or so. So we've measured the spectrum to one part in 10,000 10, and found that the spectrum is actually consistent uh, with a perfect black body uh, with a temperature of, of, of roughly 2.725 kelvins. So this you know, is, is a huge accomplishment, one of the best measured things we have in science um, and goes a long way toward um, you know, demonstrating the, uh, that we actually understand uh, early universe cosmology um, uh, in the way that we do today. Uh, but you can ask, okay, well, uh, let me come back to this, but you can ask what happens when we go uh, down to the low energy spectrum, right? So what happens if you try to make measurements um, at lower and lower uh, uh, frequencies? So that's one question you can ask. The other question you can ask about the microwave background again is you can ask, um, is it very uh, clumpy or is it, uh, do we basically get the same intensity everywhere uh, we look in the sky? Um, and this is another famous map related to the CMB. And, and this is uh, a, ma a map of the hot and cold spots uh, that you would see uh, in the sky um, over and uh, over or under the average temperature that you, you see uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, 
And the main takeaway, you know, if you, if you try to understand what the fluctuations are like, uh, is that the, the mean size of fluctuations that you see in the sky is something like one in 10 to the five. Um, so again, the fact that a CMB is very smooth uh, is one of the indications or, or, or one of the reasons we know that the CMB uh, comes from, uh, you know, has a primordial origin and not something that is produced uh, at very late times where the universe is much clumpier um, than one in 10 to the five. Um, so this is another question we can ask is, um, you know, if we go to lower, lower frequencies, do we see something uh, that is very smooth or do we see something that is very clumpy? And so let's take a look at what uh, radio telescopes uh, tell us about what the radio background looks like. Okay, but before I go into the details of what these uh, telescopes see, I, I'm just gonna uh, take one or two slides to introduce um, some uh, conventions that radio astronomers use that may not be familiar to particle physicists, um, and also try to um, explain um, yeah, what, what, what radio astronomers mean when they mention certain quantities. So in particular, when they report intensities, uh, they usually report um, the intensity of what they see uh, in the radio frequencies uh, as a temperature. Um, and in particle physics units, if we set h bar c and kb to be one, um, then in these natural units, uh, the temperature t is just directly proportional. Uh, it's just directly related uh, to the the usual spectrum. So uh, the number density of photons per unit uh, angular frequency or per unit uh, energy. Um, and in fact, the exact relation is that t is equal to pi square over omega uh, dn d omega. And the reason why uh, this relationship holds is that you know if you if you go and look at a black body spectrum. Uh, and you try to figure out what this quantity is, pi square over omega dn d omega, um, you find that uh, it, it just looks like this fraction here, omega over e to the omega over t minus one. Um, and in the limit where you're considering radio frequencies, so, so it, for the CMB, you know, the CMB is at 2.725 Kelvins, and you're looking at low frequencies, um, then omega over t is much less than one, and you can expand this exponential, and you find that this expression just tends towards t. And so that's the reason why uh, uh, radio astronomers like to report things in temperature, but just keep in mind that it's just proportional to one over omega uh, dn d omega. Um, another thing that I will try to do uh, throughout this talk is to also put in these um, h bar c's and kb's uh, for people who don't use natural units uh, frequently. Um, so, so you know, you can choose to look at the grayed out units or not, um, and the particle physicists will probably um, like to set all of these numbers to one, uh, and hopefully that's helpful for everybody in the uh, in the audience. So the punchline again is that T is just some representation of the intensity um, at uh, a particular frequency. Okay. Another thing that we will do is we will talk about uh, spectra and, and um, you know, yeah, uh, radio spectra, dark photon spectra, and so on. We will always talk about things in terms of redshift in variant quantities. Um, and this is very useful because you don't want to be confused by the fact that uh, the energy of a particular photon redshifts with time, and so if you if you plot a spectrum as a function of omega, then um, you know things have to have to move down in frequency as time passes, and and that can be quite confusing. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to refer only to uh, redshift invariant quantities. Um, in particular, we're going to refer to number densities as co-moving number densities. So this is just a regular number density divided by one plus z cubed. Um, and then for frequencies, we're going to use this variable x, uh, which is just the energy divided by uh, the temperature. And again, you know, in, in, uh, for photons or, or dark photons and so on, things that are massless uh, or relativistic, uh, this redshifts as 1 plus z, and TCMB also redshifts as 1 plus z, and so x is something that is constant with redshift. And so throughout the talk, when we talk about spectra, we're going to be talking about dn, the big N dx, which is um, number of co the co-moving number density per x. Um, and if you write this out for a black body, you can see that it is explicitly um, redshift invariant. So it's just, um, it depends only on x, which is a redshift invariant quantity, and it depends on T naught, which is the CMB temperature uh, today. And so this is a redshift invariant quantity. And so for the black body, the CMB uh, spectrum, for example, it just stays in this functional form uh, at all times um, up till, you know, entropy dumps and, and so on at B, during BBN or whatever. But at late times, uh, it is basically a constant function. So just keep in mind that X is a proxy for energy and this big N is just uh, number density. 
Okay, so let's go down to low frequencies and, and see what uh, radio telescopes tell us um, that they see. So keep in mind here, the frequencies here are below 100 gigahertz. The virus data points that I showed you earlier are, are up here above 100 gigahertz. And these are a range of uh, radio telescopes, such as uh, our K2 uh, Parks, which is the radio telescope that I showed um, in, the first, in the first slide, um, and a few other uh, data points here. And what they see is that, you know, um, over and above the CMB, so uh, over and above the 2.725 Kelvins, they see a very large power law excess. Um, and this is after subtracting out what they think is the galactic contribution. So this is just purely the extra galactic uh, radio background. And so they see a power law uh, that you can fit a very nice line to um, and down to a frequencies of about 22 megahertz, uh, you can see a huge excess over the CMB temperature of about 10 to the four uh, Kelvins or so. Um, if you fit a power law, you, you get something that looks really good, like that, that's a very good fit. Um, and it goes to something like uh, temperature to the frequency to the minus uh, 2.66 uh, or so. Okay, and this is this part here, excluding the 2.725 Kelvins of the CMB, uh, is what I'll refer to as the um, excess temperature. And so T goes like new to the minus 2.66, or in terms of the of the uh, spectrum uh, or this dn dx quantity that I introduced earlier, it goes as x to the minus 1.66 or frequency to the minus uh, 1.66. And all of these you know, radio telescopes here all agree that this power law um, is indeed there after you subtract out the galactic contribution, okay? Now, so the other thing that I mentioned was that you can, you can measure the, the the, the brightness, but you can also try to measure the spatial variation. Um, and this was done in a paper, uh, in a really interesting paper in 2012 by Holder. Um, and what he did was to uh, look at some radio telescope data and try to figure out what kinds of fluctuations you, you get from these radio telescopes. And these data points are shown here in color. So if you look at the blue, red, or the purple lines, uh, they show you what the fluctuations are as a function of angle. So this is the usual uh, L, just as in you know, the CMB power spectrum uh, uh, L modes. Um, on the Y axis here, they're plotting um, essentially the size of the fluctuations. So, so the difference in temperature of the fluctuations divided by the mean temperature T. Um, and from these radio telescopes, you find that the typical size of the fluctuations that you, you, you measure uh, is one in 10 to the two. So uh, something like 1% um, fluctuations, whereas the CMB is one in 10 to the five. Um, in, in the extra galactic radio background, it's one in 10 to the two. So you can try to see, you know, is it, is it easy to produce um, a radio background that has fluctuations on the size of one in 10 to the two? So Holder, what, what he did was to assume that um, all the radio emission that you see uh, in the extra galactic radio background uh, assume let's let's just assume that it's correlated with dark matter structure. So in 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 regions where dark matter is denser, um, there is going to be a, a brighter signal, and in regions where it's less dense, it's going to be uh, less bright. And then plot what you expect the size of the fluctuations uh, to be. And so if you look at all uh, all galaxies that are between a redshift of zero and one, the result that you get is this line in black here. And so you can see that the size of fluctuations that you expect uh, is sort of closer to uh, 0 0.05 or 0 0.03 uh, down to 0 0.02. But whatever the case is, if, if the radio emission is correlated with structure and it's coming from a redshift of 0 to 1, uh, you're well above uh, what these radio telescopes are telling you um, in terms of the smoothness. Okay. So the only way in which you could, you you could get into agreement with these uh, rad radio telescope data uh, is to say that either the radio sources are, are correlated with sources uh, with structure at Z greater than five. So they're only emitted from structures beyond a redshift of five and not after a redshift of five. Um, or you could try to smooth out the structure that you already have and say that uh, radio emissions only come from really large structures. So structures that are the size of a megaparsec or so, but not on smaller scales. And that's the only two ways uh, in which you can get your data to be in agreement uh, with this these data points. But I know these solutions are kind of strange, right? Like if if it if it's, you know, why would it be emitted at Z greater than five and not less than that? Like uh, if you want to assign a, a standard like astrophysical argument that does that, uh, that's going to be very difficult. 
Um, and also, you know, we know that there are many small scale structures, like much less than the size of a megaparsec. And, and to stop emission from these small scales versus the large structures is also uh, something that's going to be uh, difficult. So this is a very intriguing result. And, and just like the CMB um, is, is, I feel, um, a, quite a strong sign that you might want to look for primordial explanations uh, to the extragalactic radio background. Okay, so these are the two main results. There is, um, there is an, a brightness, there is a power law uh, index, and um, there is a smoothness result. And so over the years, I think since um, one of the, if we, if we go back to the radio telescope, like since these data points came out, this arcade two data points came out, um, a bunch of people have been trying to think of, you know, um, some standard and non-standard uh, astrophysical or new physics explanations for the extragalactic uh, uh, radio background. And here is my sort of very subjective uh, 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 take on how each of these uh, mechanisms fare in terms of explaining uh, the amplitude, so how bright the result is, um, the power law index, which is supposed to be minus 2.6, um, and how smooth uh, the outcome is. Um, there, there's a lot of work here, and I'm just going to pick a few. I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, so, for example, you could try to uh, try to explain all of the source, all of the radio background, as coming from discrete sources um, uh, that produce uh, 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 synchrotron. So, for example, um, you could have synchrotron coming from um, uh, active galactic nuclei or star-forming galaxies. And you could try to put together all of the AGNs and all the star forming galaxies you know, put them together and see if you can, you can reproduce uh, the right brightness um, as well as the right power law index and so on. And it turns out if you try to do that, um, and, and we think we know uh, AGNs and star forming galaxies pretty well, if you try to put together all the known sources, uh, you get only up to about 10% uh, of the total amplitude of the extragalactic uh, radio background. So here on the right, I'm showing you a plot of um, essentially a um, uh, uh, number of, uh, sorry, brightness of the sources versus, um, sorry, uh, how do I put this? Number of sources on the y-axis and x is the brightness uh, of the sources. And the data points are essentially um, star forming galaxies here and then AGNs here. Um, and if you put this together, it's only about 10% of the full signal. And if you think that there should be other sources, um, then these curves here, so this solid curve here, this dashed curve, and this really narrow curve here, are the possible shapes um, of sources that need to be there in order to be consistent with these measurements, um, but at the same time able to explain the, the amplitude of the extragalactic background. So you, you'll see something weird here, which is that they're all either you need like a, a whole bunch of sources at like very low brightness, or you need, um, or you need something that's very narrow and as close, as bright as possible, which is, which is somewhere around um, here. And either of these explanations are kind of strange because these populations are, are supposed to be large and yet haven't been uh, observed and we have no idea what they would be. Um, and so trying to explain it with discrete sources um, becomes very difficult unless we can figure out a way in which we would have one of these large populations that we didn't know of uh, other than AGNs and star forming galaxies. Um, let me just skip this one and just jump straight to uh, dark matter annihilation. Uh, so one, something that a lot of people have been studying um, over the years is having you know, this exotic form of energy injection where you have two dark matter particles annihilating each other and producing electrons. And then these electrons end up you know, uh, encountering regions of high magnetic field uh, in which they can undergo, they can, uh, they can radiate synchrotron radiation, which is then picked up as the extragalactic radio background that we see. Um, and if you posit that and you include some degree of, of optimism, then yes, you can, you can kind of hit the right amplitude, you can hit the right power law index, um, and it can be reasonably smooth. Um, but you have to do some, some interesting uh, gymnastics to, to make this work out. So for example, if you want dark matter decay to work out, right? So remember that um, this, the smoothness criterion here um, was that it couldn't be correlated with structures at Z less than five. Um, and so if you have dark matter decaying at Z more than five, um, then that's okay. Um, so that's one way in which you can get, get around this. Um, another thing that you generally need is you need very large magnetic fields. So the magnetic fields have to be large enough that 
Um, for example, a dark matter particle decaying at Z greater than five is able to emit uh, synchrotron radiation um, that ends up making up the extragalactic radio background. Um, and in general, you know, we have constraints on the primordial magnetic field coming from um, the CMB and so on. And, and, and in order to make this work, you're going to be in tension uh, with some of these results. So there are some, some uh, interesting new physics models that could do it, but generally they're stretching um, um, you know, what we already know, what we already think we know about magnetic fields or about structure. Okay. So I hope that kind of convinces you, although I didn't go through all the other astrophysical explanations, but they each have their problems reproducing the smoothness uh, or the brightness or the power law. Um, uh, I hope that is pretty convincing that you, you, you might be interested in learning about whether any kind of new physics explanations are available uh, to get you the extragalactic radio background uh, that we observe, uh, especially in terms of its brightness uh, and smoothness. So that's sort of the summary of the first part uh, of the talk. And in the next part, I will go and start talking about uh, new physics explanations uh, to the extragalactic radio background. Okay, so let me go on then. So let me tell you what the basic idea is. Okay, we start with a very light dark matter candidate. So you should start, you should think of something that resembles um, the, the, the usual axion or axion like particles. Um, so this particle, we're going to call it A. Uh, it's very light. We want it to be in a range of 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 3 EV or so. Uh, it is cosmologically stable, but not entirely stable. Uh, it decays with a very long lifetime. So the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. Um, and it decays into, uh, it undergoes a two body decay of which one of the particles is going to be something called uh, a dark photon that we call A prime. So the dark photon is something that's very similar to the standard model photon. Uh, you can imagine it as something that, that um, you know, is a force carrier uh, in the dark sector. Um, and generally, um, unlike the standard model photon, it can have some uh, mass. Um, and in this case, we're interested in a mass of between 10 to the minus 14 EV to 10 to the minus 9 EV uh, for reasons that I will come to um, in a minute. In addition, um, we, we don't want just the, the axion to decay in vacuum. Uh, we also want to introduce a thermal bath of these A primes. So in addition to the dark matter, there's also a thermal distribution of A primes with some temperature T A prime. Um, and the reason that we want this thermal bath to be there uh, is because it actually affects uh, de the decay rate um, and changes the spectrum of A primes that you get in a way that is favorable uh, to getting the right uh, the spectral index um, that I will come to later on. Uh, yeah, Gonzalo, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was wondering if you're going to specify what this other particle in the two body decay is later, or? Um, so we have some models, uh, explicit models, where this um, is another dark photon, so not the same as this dark photon. Um, but in general, it, it doesn't really matter what this is. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so we think that there are models where this can be, um, for example, it could be like a dipole transition of an excited state down to a ground state. Um, that, that, that might also work. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's what the thermal distribution is gonna do. It's gonna, it's gonna enhance the decay rate. So it's gonna enhance it because um, it's, it already has some occupation number there and it's gonna um, provide some Bose enhancement uh, to the decay rate. And this is something that we, we, come, we will call stimulated decay. And this is exactly what happens in lasers, right? So in lasers, you have, you have atoms in an excited state. Um, you produce um, photons that bounce back and forth in the cavity. And the presence of the photons um, in the, uh, uh, the excited state, the excited state being in the presence of these photons uh, will actually want to decay down to the ground state um, with an extra enhancement because of this uh, Bose enhancement. So it's exactly the same uh, mechanism at play here. And then what we're going to do is um, we're going to introduce some small mixing between the dark photon and the standard model photon. Um, and then what's going to happen is that uh, the dark photon and the photon can mix and they can oscillate into each other. And this is very similar to what happens with neutrinos. So neutrinos of different flavors can oscillate into, into uh, different flavors and so on. Um, and in particular, in, in if we choose the mass of the dark photon to be uh, the range that we specified earlier, then we can also get resonant um, enhancements to the oscillation 
uh, which is something that we will make use of uh, to get the right spectrum as well as to get the right brightness uh, of the uh, radio background. Okay, so this is the full picture. Sorry, let me just show it again. You have dark matter decays into A prime in the presence of a thermal distribution, and then the A prime oscillates into a radio photon. And this radio photon is the thing that uh, contributes to the radio background that we see today. Okay, so to fully understand this model, um, I need to spend some time telling you about dark photons. Um, so uh, I'll spend I'll, I'll talk about what dark photons are and and uh, how they how they undergo this resonant oscillation um, and so on in this next section. Okay, so the typical picture that we should have of what a dark photon is is that um, if you imagine all the dark matter particles on one side and all the standard model particles on on the other side. So we have electrons ups and downs uh, in the standard model sector. And on the other side, you have, you have dark matter in the dark sector. Um, then this idea of a dark photon is one that is very popular because um, it is one of the ways in which you can get um, interactions uh, between the dark sector and the standard model sector, uh, in particular through this mixing epsilon here, um, that essentially allows you to have a renormalizable coupling um, that, that governs the mixing between uh, these two sectors. So it's something that people have studied uh, in the context of, for example, um, if you have a dark matter particle in the dark sector, then it can, it can interact with the standard model through this A prime, um, and you can see signals, for example, in direct detection um, and so on. Um, or uh, you could also imagine scenarios where the dark photon itself uh, is the dark matter, um, this is not the case uh, in our model, but it's, it's a very popular alternative that people uh, think about. Um, and so this dark photon model here is, is just a very simple uh, uh, example of how you can get dark sectors or dark matter um, with some kind of mixing interaction uh, with the standard model sector. So just like in uh, neutrinos, for example, um, if you introduce a mixing between photons and dark photons, then these two states, uh, the photon and the dark photon, um, um, if they're produced in sort of flavor eigenstate, so for example, if you have electrons that are producing a photon, then this photon will come out in a flavor eigenstate, just like, uh, just like for example, an electron flavored neutrino. Um, and as they propagate, uh, what happens is that the mixing uh, uh, epsilon between uh, photons and dark photons uh, allow these uh, two particles to kind of oscillate into each other. And it's exactly the same as what happens uh, in neutrinos. Um, and so this means that, you know, the dark photon and the photon um, can oscillate into each other. And one of the interesting things you can do if, if there is a mixing is that you can try to detect um, these oscillations, you know, going from, for example, photons to dark photons and back to photons. Uh, so, for example, you could you could try to do um, a light shining through wall experiment where you have a radio frequency cavity here. You produce a photon and it bounces around inside this, this cavity, and some of it actually oscillates into the A prime, uh, the dark photon, which doesn't interact with the cavity wall and it escapes. And then at the other end of your cavity, you put another cavity that's called the receiver cavity, which you don't you don't uh, pump it with any photons at all. And then you try to wait for these dark photons to reach the receiver cavity and uh, convert back uh, into regular photons. So this is something, uh, an experiment that you can do to try to detect uh, the presence of A primes. And, and this happens in, in pure vacuum. They just oscillate into each uh, state like this. Um, if you go into lighter masses, so for example, uh, if we look at this setup, like there are experiments that are set up like this to try to look for dark photons. Um, there is a characteristic oscillation length over which uh, there is a maximum transition between photons and dark photons. Um, and that length is about one meter for A primes that are about like 10 to the minus six uh, EV or so. And if you go and try to look for lighter dark photons, so for example, 10 to the minus nine EV or 10 to the minus 14 EV even, all of these, um, all of these dark photons will have oscillation lengths that are very, very long. So something like um, on the order of the radius of the earth or even larger. And so it's very hard to detect these um, dark photons um, using like a light shining through wall experiment terrestrially. Um, but you can try to look for it uh, cosmologically. And the reason why uh, cosmological effects really help is because um, when they propagate in, in the cosmos, um, they're actually propagating through um, a medium which is, which is, which is ionized. 
um, and it's actually a, a weak plasma, right? So, so there's some number density of free electrons uh, in, in, in the baryonic gas that's all around us. Um, and this introduces some propagation medium effects uh, that can encourage the oscillations between photons and dark photons. So the crucial thing about these, uh, uh, about the uh, baryonic plasma that's around us, the, the, the crucial parameter that governs uh, whether, you know, how dark photons and photons oscillate to each other uh, is something called the homogeneous plasma mass. Um, and at the frequencies that we are interested in, this, this plasma mass is just identical to what we call also call the plasma frequency. Um, and this is roughly given by something like 10 to the minus 14 EV uh, or so today. And so if I make a plot of this uh, homogeneous plasma mass or the plasma frequency uh, as a function of time, uh, this just tracks the number density of electrons. Um, and you can see, you know, between a redshift of you know, roughly zero all the way to 10 to the three, uh, you get, you get a, it scans a plasma mass of between 10 to the minus 14 to about 10 to the minus nine uh, EV or so. And you get these like interesting bumps here that come from uh, things like reionization uh, or recombination. Um, and so under the assumption, if, if everything was homogeneous and, and everywhere in the universe, you have the same number density of electrons, um, then everywhere in the universe, uh, the plasma mass would scan between 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 9 EV um, between a redshift of 1,000 all the way till today. Okay, so what happens, uh, what, like, what does this plasma mass uh, do? So something interesting happens when uh, the plasma mass M gamma uh, exactly matches uh, the A prime mass uh, Ma prime, which is why we are interested in Ma primes uh, in this range of about 10 to minus 14 EV to 10 to minus 9 EV. So this is actually an interesting sort of quantum physics problem that you could you could do. Uh, essentially, there are two states. There is uh, the photon and there is the A prime. Initially, uh, let's say at early times, um, when the universe is very dense, the plasma mass is very high um, and could be above the, ME, the value of Ma prime. And in this case, you have two quantum states that are, that are very well separated um, and oscillations between the two um, are, are, are very weak. And then as the universe expands, uh, the number density of electrons decreases and the plasma mass decreases. Uh, you will see that the plasma mass actually decreases and the energy splitting between the two states uh, reduces. And then at some point when M gamma is equal to M A prime, they, they have equal energies. And at that point, you get, you get very rapid conversions uh, between the two states. Um, and if you work out you know, what, what is the probability at which a photon converts into an A prime at this point here where M gamma is equal to M A prime, uh, it's given by something like the mixing squared um, times some characteristic length, uh, vacuum oscillation length, which is given by M A prime squared over two times the frequency of the photon um, times uh, the time scale at which the two states kind of stay close to each other. Um, and for cosmology, this time scale is going to be something on the order of a, a Hubble time scale. Um, and so if you put this two, if you put these things together, um, you find that this Hubble time scale is actually really large uh, because you know it's it's like cosmological uh, distances. And this greatly enhances uh, the probability of conversion between photons and dark photons uh, at this resonance condition. And so the, the idea is, you know, if you have an A prime that has a mass between 10 to the 40, minus 14 and 10 to the minus nine, this resonance condition is gonna be met at some time. You're gonna get very rapid conversions between the two states. Um, and, and so you're gonna get conversions between dark photons and photons um, and also vice versa, actually. Okay, so all of the stuff that I've just told you about actually, uh, you know, assumes that everything was homogeneous, right? I, I made you that plot of what the plasma uh, plasma masses is a function of redshift. And that was assuming that everywhere in the universe, you know, the number density of electrons is equal to the homogeneous value. But of course, you, you know that the universe is very much not homogeneous. Um, and so you should, you should find a way to take into account the fact that there are all these fluctuations. Um, and this, this is actually a whole talk in itself. And I, I, could, I could spend an, another hour talking about this. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, we found a way in which we could actually figure out how to capture all of these fluctuations, you know, that you would encounter the photon comes in, um, in these two papers in 2020 with, with pretty much some of the same authors that are on this work. Um, and so this means that even with inhomogeneities and the fact that 
uh, everywhere you look, you're going to you're going to see something different. Uh, we're able to to calculate a sky averaged uh, quantity for the probability of conversions between uh, photons and dark photons. Um, and if you're interested, I, 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 I'll point you to these two papers here uh, to, to learn more. Okay, so the full summary of this section is that um, if you have dark photons of that certain mass range, 10 to minus 14 to 10 to minus nine EV, um, then you're gonna get these resonant conversions. Um, and we're going to, uh, essentially that's an important part of our model. Um, and I just wanna point out that we can actually calculate what the sky average conversion probability is uh, of dark photons into photons. Um, and now we're gonna apply it um, and see that that's gonna give you the right uh, spectrum for the uh, extragalactic radio background. Okay, are there any quick questions at this point? Okay, so if not, let me just dive straight in and tell you about um, what kinds what kinds of spec spectra do we get? Do we get the right power law? Do we get the right amplitude and so on? Okay, so let me just recap the basic idea again. We want a light dark matter A uh, with a mass of between 10 to minus five and 10 to minus three EV. It's cosmologically stable, but it has a very long lifetime, much greater than the age of the universe. It decays into two dark photons in the presence of uh, a thermal distribution of A primes that is already there uh, primordially. Um, and this uh, thermal distribution causes a stimulated decay of A um, into these two dark photons. These dark photons have a mass of between 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 9 EV. And so what happens is that they resonantly oscillate into photons after recombination. And these radio photons that are produced after the, this uh, resonant oscillation are exactly the extragalactic radio background uh, that we should see. Okay, so the first thing that, the, the next few slides is gonna contain some math because I need to convince you that I do indeed get the right power law uh, that you see in the extragalactic background. So the first thing that we want to compute is, you know, you have a decaying dark matter. What is the spectrum of A primes uh, that you get, um, uh, you know, as, as the decay happens? So I'm going to calculate this redshift invariant quantity. Uh, as I said, it's D, the Na, which is, which is the co-moving density with respect to dx. And remember, x is just uh, omega over t uh, or h bar omega over kb t. And then I'm, I'm just gonna put down some quantities that should be in there, right? So for example, um, I know that uh, it should depend on TCMB. Um, it should go as the dark matter density, right? Like uh, the number of decay particles obviously is directly proportional to the number density of small a in the first place. And so that's just uh, rho a over ma. Uh, remember I'm dealing with a redshift invariant quantity. I'm dealing with a co-moving density and that's why it's just rho a zero here, which is the number, the energy density today. Um, it's going to be directly proportional to the decay width or inversely proportional to the decay rate. And that just tells you how, how often this process is happening. So it should be goes, go as one over tau, uh, tau of the, the, the lifetime of this decay. Um, it should also depend on uh, the, the time scale uh, at which the, um, the decay is happening um, during you know, the cosmic history of the universe. Um, and so that, that's why there is this one over H, which is the Hubble parameter. Uh, and we should, we should put the Hubble parameter at the point at which this decay um, is happening. And so it goes as one over H um, at the redshift at which the, the, the decay is happening. Um, and then just by dimensional analysis, the, the one other thing that we should include um, is one over omega. And let me just come back to the, the this Z decay thing. Um, so, so the radio, uh, the radio background spans you know, uh, uh, many orders of magnitude in frequency. Um, but in this model where you have something of fixed mass that is decaying into two particles, and then these two particles are uh, redshift uh, as, as, they, as they propagate all the way to us, um, every frequency that you observe at uh, corresponds to some redshift at which a decay occurs uh, so that this, these uh, A primes that you, that you get from these uh, dark matter decays reach us with the correct uh, frequency. And so the frequency at which decay occurs is just the ratio of you know, the energy of the A prime at the point of decay uh, versus the energy that you observe it at today. And if you work it out, it's just basically given by MA divided by 
um, 2x times the CMB temperature uh, today. Okay, so the, the thing to keep in mind is that every frequency bin uh, corresponds to a, the decay happening at some higher and higher redshift as we go to lower and lower frequencies. Okay, so this is the dark photon spectrum. Um, in addition, there was this effect that we mentioned earlier, which is stimulated decay, and this is due to the presence uh, of a dark photon bath um, that, that enhances the decay rate through Bose enhancement. Um, so the decay rate is not actually just one over tau, which is something that you compute um, you know, uh, in the vacuum. It's enhanced by the occupation number of A primes. And if we take a thermal distribution, then the occupation number of A prime is just gonna be given by the usual Bose-Einstein uh, occupation number. Um, and, and that's just given by, by this expression here. And if we expand it um, in, in uh, if, if the temperature is much larger than the mass of the A itself, um, then what's gonna happen is, is that instead of just decaying with a rate of uh, uh, you know, one over tau vacuum, uh, it's gonna have this extra term here, which is proportional to the temperature of this bath here divided by the mass A, the mass of the dark matter. And so this quantity here is much greater than one and it enhances uh, the decay rate um, by, by some factor. And so if we put all of these things together, so I, I just put in the, the stimulated decay factor here uh, and we make a plot, um, then you can see that for example, uh, TA prime is gonna scale as one plus Z decay. And remember one plus Z decay is inversely proportional to X. And so this scales as one over X. Um, this scales as one over X since X is just omega over T. Um, and then Hubble uh, scales, Hubble at Z decay scales as X to the three halves. And if you, if you put everything together, um, the A prime uh, uh, spectrum scales as X to the minus half uh, due to all of these effects uh, put together. And so here's a plot of DNA, D, DNA prime DX as a function of X. Um, and so the virus uh, values of X is sort of to the right of this plot. And then here are the relevant X's that you would wanna look at uh, in terms of the radio uh, background. And you can see indeed, you know, even after doing a full calculation, um, it still broadly looks like X to the minus half. And then there are some effects coming from the fact that, you know, if you decay during, um, instead of during matter domination, you decay during radiation domination, you get a different power. Um, and then here, it's just uh, coming from the fact that the, the, the enhancement here uh, doesn't actually scale uh, as T over M uh, at, at, the, at the extremes. Okay, so you're gonna get something that looks like X to the minus half uh, for the dark photon spectrum. And then for the photon spectrum, this is what happens. You have um, resonant uh, oscillations between the dark photon and the photon. The probability scales as one over omega. And so when you put it together, previously I said that the dark photon uh, spectrum scales is X to the minus half. The probability picks up an extra factor of X to the minus one. And so the overall uh, power law that the, the photon spectrum, the radio photon spectrum scales is X to the minus three halves. Um, and so here is, I'm showing you the uh, photon spectrum that you would get uh, based on all three of these effects put together. And it does indeed scale roughly as X to the minus three halves. Um, and this is the CMB um, uh, spectrum that I'm plotting here for reference in the dotted line. Um, and so this is the power law that we get um, X to the minus three halves. And if you compare it with what we wanted initially, uh, remember all the way to the beginning, what is the radio, um, what is the radio background that we observe? Uh, the ra radio background scales as T to the minus 2.6. Um, which in terms of the uh, which in terms of the spectrum dn dx scales is x to the minus 1.6. Um, and what we have achieved is that we have managed to produce a spectrum that is x to the minus 1.5. Um, and so this is quite close um, to what we should see um, in the radio background. Okay, so this is the plot without the data points. And if I if I put the data points here now, and now I'm plotting in terms of radio frequency versus the um, excess temperature. So this is the, the brightness minus the CMB brightness. Um, our fit for these particular parameter values uh, is shown in blue and the radio telescope data points are shown uh, in red here. And you can see that a fit um, is really, really good. Um, and these, these are just some points that I've picked randomly and sort of like I fit it by, by eye, so it's just chi by eye. Um, but 
uh, there might be other data points that, that do look even better. And we are sort of in the process of figure out, figuring out like what is the range um, of parameters that, that could lead to a good fit to the spectrum. Um, and then on the right here, I've just multiplied by frequency to the five halves um, so that everything kind of flattens out and you can see the data points um, uh, you know, blown up a little bit more. I um, mean, you can see, you know, our model, it's not perfectly minus 2.5. There are a little bit of wriggles coming from, you know, for example, decaying and radiation domination instead of matter domination and so on. Um, and, and, but you can see here, you know, that it, it goes through most of the data points um, and it does a pretty good job uh, fitting everything. So I, I should point out that there are, there are, you know, I think I, I did mention this, but there is some contribution from the result sources. Um, and here I'm, I'm also adding the result sources to our, um, our, our full contribution from the new physics model that you just saw um, uh, to, to do the fit. But actually I could also remove this uh, resolve sources and, and also get a good fit. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, in general, this, these are the kinds of fits that we, we see with our model. Uh, yes, Jim. So the the one point six six it's being driven by those data points around ten gigahertz, as opposed to the one point five slope. Um, let's see. So I think here on the on the right, I'm plotting. Um, I'm multiplying by two point five, and so the I think the the best fit that they want is actually. Um, on this plot here, it should be new to the minus 0.1. So something with a gentle downward slope, which kind of makes sense. Like you want to hit these points and then also these points because these error bars are very small, whereas these are kind of large. But generally it's anything between like 1.5 and 1.6 should do it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, we can get this excess temperature, and I'll come back to some of the constraints on these parameters. And, and I, I'll just tell you right now that these parameters are experimentally allowed. Um, and so the next thing I want to go through is the smoothness. Like, how smooth is, is this? And, and the smoothness, remember, um, oops, sorry, remember the result that I showed you earlier from the power spectrum of um, uh, deduced from radio telescopes? Um, and the fluctuations that you need are something like one in 100. Um, and so to, to calculate the, the fluctuations, um, it's, it's quite complicated and I'll just give you a flavor of how it's done. Um, but the, the quantity that we wanna calculate is uh, the two point correlation function. So we wanna pick two, two lines in the sky. So like two patches of the sky. And we wanna figure out the average fluctuations uh, in the temperature that you expect um, from our model uh, as a function of uh, the opening angle theta averaged over the entire sky. So if you think about it, you know, the, the, the source of, of our photons is, is from the conversions of these dark photons that have been produced uh, from the decays into the photons. Um, and uh, the, the reason for fluctuations is that some of these uh, dark photons, you know, as they travel to us, uh, they encounter different uh, densities um, uh, and, and also different uh, plasma masses of the photons. And so they convert at like slightly different places, right? And you want to find the correlation uh, between um, two paths as a function of angle. So if you think about it, it's just given by the sky average integral of, you know, over two paths of the probability of conversions of A primes into photons. Um, and choose, you choose two paths that have an opening angle of theta uh, divided by, you know, just the mean probability squared um, for conversions. And this will give you um, the, the correlation function um, if you are able to do this sky averaging. Um, and the way we do this is we, we pick two points um, and we assume that you know, uh, every two points that we choose, uh, they're related by uh, a joint Gaussian PDF. So um, pick any two points um, along, along these two paths and uh, we, we assume that they have a joint probability distribution function that is Gaussian. Um, and we, we say that uh, it is Gaussian with variance and correlation uh, that is set by the power spectrum uh, P sub K, uh, P of K um, that we can compute, uh, you know, given for example, a nonlinear matter power spectrum uh, or, or whatever. Um, and so the correlations would be strongest when they are very close to each other. 
uh, which happens when they are at equal redshifts. And then when they are different redshifts, um, they are much further apart. And so the correlations actually die uh, quite rapidly um, as, as, you know, when you consider two points on these two paths that are very far apart. Um, and so in practice, what happens is that there are correlations between these two points, um, between these two paths at all points where Z is equal to Z prime. So, so um, this point here is correlated very strongly with this point um, and so on. And all you have to do is just kind of integrate uh, the, the correlations along uh, the two paths. I'm not sure I explained that very well. Um, it's still kind of almost work in progress. And, um, um, and, and there are a lot of details here that I'm hiding. Um, but, but essentially, you know, we, if, we, if we assume that everything is Gaussian, we can actually compute uh, this quantity here. Okay. And then once you compute that, you can compute the CLs, uh, just like in the CMB power spectrum. Um, and so here is the plot that we get uh, for the smoothness. So I, I showed you this plot by Holder earlier, and here I'm translating into um, a you know, different set of units. Uh, but essentially, um, at this point here, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at the fluctuations uh, of the temperature scaled to what you would see at 140 megahertz, at which, this, at which the excess radio temperature is about 255 kelvins or so. The radio, um, the radio uh, results that I showed you previously reported something like one in 10 to two fluctuations. So here the, the excess temperature is about 255 and the kinds of power that they see in the fluctuations are on the order of um, uh, one or so. And this is consistent with the fact that they do indeed see something like um, one, in, one in 10 to the two uh, fluctuations. And then for our model, we get something that is more like one in 10 to the three. So these, these points here, the, the points that are stars uh, should be compared with the radio um, observations. And we see that the size of fluctuations, um, this is like delta T, delta T of one line versus times delta T of another. So the, the actual fluctuations should be the square root of this compared to the square root of this. And so we get fluctuations that are 10 times uh, smaller than what you see um, in radio telescopes. And the intuitive reason why, um, why we don't get very large fluctuations is that unlike dark matter decay or dark matter annihilations, uh, our conversions do not happen in overdense regions or underdense regions. Remember that the conversions happen when M gamma is equal to Ma prime. Um, and so um, when, M, when the mean value of M gamma is very close to Ma prime, that's where most of the conversions are happening. And so that means that we prefer to convert in sort of like regions of space where we are close to the mean density rather than, you know, over densities or under densities, which are very rare uh, compared to regions where you have, where you are close to the mean density. And so our result is just not correlated with structure at all. Um, and that's why we get something that, uh, that is much smoother. Now, you might also worry about um, the fact that you have decay, like dark matter is decaying, right? And, and so you might worry that there's a correlation between where they're decaying um, um, and what you would see in terms of fluctuations. Um, but generally in our models, we, all, we also have the decays of the, of the dark matter happening at Z greater than five. Um, and so at, again, you know, going back to the Holder result, uh, we have decays happening early. And so there are also not enough fluctuations at such high redshifts to kind of push you above um, these data points. And that's why we, we think we, we get a very smooth, uh, 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 radio excess compared to um, what you might uh, expect from dark matter annihilation or dark matter decay. Okay, so the last bit is just to show you that all the other constraints uh, are respected. So if I come back to um, this plot here, I'm showing you again the photon spectrum that we expect. So this is dn dx, and this is compared to the CMB. Now remember that we've, we've measured the black body spectrum um, at, at the microwave uh, frequencies uh, to something like one part in 10 to the four. So any, any um, distortions here have to be small. Um, and indeed, if you, if you look at our spectrum, right, um, it, it follows X to the minus three halves, and then there's sort of a cutoff. Um, and this cutoff corresponds to the fact that there's a kinematic threshold because the dark matter, is the dark matter has a certain mass. And when it decays, right, there's, there's a maximum energy uh, at which you're emitting these A primes. And that's where uh, this cutoff occurs. And because of this cutoff, you can be very far away from um, the CMB uh, at, 
at where virus starts to kick in. And so you get something that's much less than uh, distortions on the level of one in 10 to the four. And so we don't get any significant distortions uh, in the virus frequency bins. Um, another interesting result that was actually um, worked out in 2020 was that you can actually use some of these radio telescopes, uh, like 21, 21 cm um, telescopes, for example, uh, to try to figure out if there are any signs from these, you know, from 21 cm power spectrum measurements um, that there is an excess of uh, radio uh, of radio photons uh, in the early universe. Um, and it turns out that that you can actually put some limits on like how early the the extra galactic radio excess could have been produced. Um, and it turns out you can't produce the full excess at a redshift of about like nine, for example. Um, and it turns out that for our model, so here I'm showing you uh, the photon spectrum as a function of redshift. Uh, and it turns out that for our model, this is the spectrum that you get at Z of zero. And you can see that most of the photons are actually produced uh, at very late times. And so we also evade this very interesting um, constraint coming from NOFA, uh, which just says you can't produce the full spectrum um, at very early times and expect it to be consistent with 21 cm uh, uh, measurements. Another thing is, of course, your dark matter can't just decay at arbitra like arbitrarily quickly because otherwise you won't have enough dark matter. Um, and so uh, there is a limit onto how much dark matter can actually decay. Um, and if you see the, the lifetimes that we pick here, it's consistent um, even with the inclusion of stimulated decay uh, with the Planck limits um, that says that no more than 2.6% of dark matter um, can decay. Um, and finally, um, just two quick ones. Um, there's also a limit on how much mixing can exist between A primes and photons. And this again, you know, just relies on the fact that you have such a good measurement of the, of the CMB energy spectrum. If some of the photons can actually oscillate into A primes, um, then you would, you would uh, lose some of these photons and you would see a distortion uh, in the CMB energy, uh, uh, energy spectrum. Uh, this is a, a, a constraint that we worked out in 2020. Um, and again, we've picked a value of epsilon that is consistent uh, with the uh, experimental, uh, the virus bounds on these kinds of mixings. Um, and the last thing that I want to point out is, of course, your, your dark sector also can't be too hot. Um, so the A prime temperature can't be so large that they contribute significantly to the relativistic degrees of freedom uh, in the early universe. Um, and so there's a limit on how much relativistic um, degrees of freedoms you could have at recombination. And, and that's something like 0.33. And that's satisfied as long as the dark sector is significantly colder um, than the CMB. So anything that is you know, below 0.3 or 0.4 roughly, um, you should be fine uh, with respect to these N effective bounds. So these are all the experimental bounds. We're still in the process of trying to figure out like what is the full range of parameters that can be allowed um, to produce this uh, power law. Um, and hopefully we will figure that out soon. Um, but in the meantime, I think uh, it's quite safe to say that we have proposed a new dark sector model that can um, explain how bright of a spectrum that you get and how smooth uh, the extra galactic radio background is. Um, and we think it is, it is something that, that does pretty well, especially when compared to other um, new physics explanations and as well as uh, standard, more standard uh, astrophysics explanations um, of the extra galactic radio. Uh, excess. Uh, so with that, I'll just uh, wrap up and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. Uh, are there questions? Okay, uh, Gonzalo, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Hongwon. Uh, very interesting talk. So um, I think in the in the slide before this, I noticed that so the epsilon that you're using oh, on the previous one, sorry. Um, the epsilon that you're using is below the bounds, but not too far away, right? Yeah. So would you expect that future uh, things like Pixie would be able to test uh, your scenario? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it doesn't have like, I think I just picked one that is not uh, like super far away, but you could actually decrease, decrease this by decreasing tau. Um, and you can see the tau is actually quite far away. So, so the tau limit is like 10 to 19. And mm -hmm. here's 10 or 21. So we don't have to live so close, okay. um, but you're right. Like it's, it would be really interesting if Pixie uh, came online because that would close um, two orders of magnitude mm -hmm. um, and it would be quite a strong constraint. Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps not completely roll, roll out the explanation. I think but... not. Like we're mm -hmm. still working out the full range, um, okay. but, but 
again, like, you know, tau, like if you, if you look at this, like there's a limit on tau, so you can't, you can't drop that too much. And so yep. epsilon also can't be too low. So there's definitely a finite point where like none of this works. And mm -hmm. I think, I'm not sure if Pixie can get there, but, but it's mm -hmm. not like arbitrarily easy to evade. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Are there any other kinds of observations that could potentially corroborate this scenario? Um, it's a very good question. I was hoping that I haven't thought about this very closely. At one point, we thought edges or like any 21 cm global signal would do it. Um, but you can see here that, so, so for, for 21 cm, uh, what you want to see is um, you produce the, these radio signals early at like high Zs. And then by Z of 17, um, you have an excess in the radio. And, and for 21 cm, it's an X of about 10 and minus two. So somewhere here. Um, but but you need it to have been produced at Z of 17. And you can see here that at Z of 10, it's still really, really tiny. Um, so if there are parts of parameter space where, where like a lot of the photons are actually produced early on, then you might see something in 21 cm uh, global signal as well, which would be really interesting because then it would be a, like a coherent picture of what's happening um, in the radio background. Other than that, I think the, the next big hope is Pixie um, because Pixie would be able to close quite a bit of, of space if we could find like CMB distortions. But this is really hard. I mean, because this also assumes that you can remove all the other foregrounds, um, which, is, which is unclear at this point. Um, those are the two that I can think of. Yeah. The, the coupling to regular photons is just too small to be uh, amenable to re axion resonant cavity searches, I guess. The, it's, the problem is that the mass is too, too light. Uh -huh. so, so if you look at, um, yeah, actually, if you see this orange line here. No, but the, uh, the axion mass isn't that light, is it? It's, you have it as nearly 10 to the minus 3 EV. For the axion, um, it's, it goes back to this, uh, yeah. Let me just go back to this uh, oscillation length. Um, so when, when you, can, you can try to do one of these, um, yeah, like cavity experiments, right? Like light shining through wall. Um, sorry, just I need to get to the right. Yeah, yeah, but that's about the dark photon. I was talking about the axion. Ah, the axion is dark though. So it decays into two dark photons. I know, but it's got, um, because of the epsilon, it has a small coupling to Ooh. regular, or, or does it? Maybe it doesn't even, I'm not sure. Anyway, it's probably too small. Yeah, it would be epsilon, it would be like, Epsilon squared. Epsilon squared times one over FA. Yeah. 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 So, so this is most likely not a QCD axiom. No, no. It's not. A, it, it's definitely not because it has to decay into two dark photons, not two visible photons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I thought I thought the motivation for the mass range would be that, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, it, it actually doesn't have to be a, an axion. Um, it could be, I, I think at one point I said it could have been um, excited state to ground state and then it emits a, emits a dark photon. Uh, so it, it's just that uh, we were, we were, we were start, our starting point was this model here, this, this Pospilov et al. paper in 2018, um, which tried to explain the edges result using a similar model. Um, and they considered a dark axion, but it really doesn't have to be a dark axion. Maybe I can ask a quick question. So have you thought about like the early universe side of things? So um, how feasible would it be to have like a dark, dark matter model with the right abundance, which has both these dark photons that, that kind of hang around and also has this like dark axion? It's a very good question. Um, the naive, um, e even in this paper, this 2018 paper, uh, if you look at how, um, whether you could just use a misalignment uh, mechanism to produce the, the dark axion, you'll find that you can't, like it, it doesn't give you the right abundance at all. Um, so we are, we have not thought about the early universe cosmology. Like we would have to do some work to produce it at the right abundance. But, but again, right, um, I, I also wanna stress that it doesn't have to be all of the dark matter. Um, we, like the only three things that we need is like something decays, 
plus these the thermal bath and, and this resonance oscillations. Um, so, so it could be a subcomponent, in which case we could actually reduce the decay lifetime significantly. Um, it's just that it's it's kind of more convenient to to just assume that it's the dark matter and just not have to vary that um, that dimension. But but you're right. Like it, I think naively looking at this model, it's really hard to produce uh, the A's at the right uh, abundance, which which is a problem for for this model. Yeah, but we haven't really thought too much about this. Okay. Yeah, I, I was also thinking about because you have this like thermal distribution of phase. I was also wondering if you have like, um, like a thermal mass for the a, the a prime as well. So like if you, if that would affect the resonant conversion because the a prime would also have a varying mass over like the time scale of the universe. Um, yes, uh, indeed. Um, uh, so good. So if you couple this a prime. Uh, to another particle that is dark, then yes, you you could mess up the you could mess up this oscillation. And this is something that actually um, Josh is studying with with someone else. Um, um, but in this case, in our in the model, like sort of the fiducial model that we have in mind, this a prime is not coupled to anything, so we assume that um, the plasma mass is zero. But you do you can introduce other particles um, that would mess with the with the uh, thermal mass, yeah. Well, it is coupled to the axion in itself, so you could make a thermal loop with that, but is it just too small? We assume that the axion is cold, so that's that that loop is confusing, and I don't know how to compute that. But if the if the yeah. um, the dark photon has a temperature, then uh, you know, it's got a thermal. There'll be a thermal effect in that that loop, I think, even if the, if the axion's cold. Um, ah, so yeah. I, I thought, I thought that the thing in the loop has to be in, like, I, I know how to compute that loop if the thing in the loop is in, in, in a thermal distribution, but then if it's cold, I, I don't actually know. I assume that that correction goes to zero. Um, yeah, well, I thought that if, just one of the things in the loop was thermal, it might be good enough, but I'm not sure. So I have to think. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I guess just looking at the time, uh, we're slightly over. So maybe we'll close the questions uh, here. And yeah, thanks.